Greetings from Mel. Greetings from Sam. It is our pleasure to have you with us for another BOOK podcast moment. BOK, our book, also known as Building Our Own Knowledge, is a co-created cloud for interrogating, finding, making, and sharing experiences and knowledge on our own terms. This podcast is brought to you by the labor of love of book working group members Sim Mendes and Melisande Varro. The music carrying us through is by book working group member and commissioned artist Samir Saunders. Samir brought their sonic waves to its final form by reading All About Love, New Visions by Bell Hooks. We thank our loving ancestors for using our beings as vessels. Mm. We hope you wind our way with this DIY podcast as much as we do. me uh welcome back to the book, book uh podcast building our own knowledge be okay so it's me i'm sim a uh, books artist liaison a uh, podcast producer and facilitator and i'm here with mel uh books artist curator and i'm here with amandine gay today uh super 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 excited um so yeah so we're just going to jump into intros um amandine i'll let you go first so can introduce yourself if you know your top three astrological signs um, and also what you care about today. Okay, so morning, afternoon, depending on the person who is listening from where. Uh, so my name is Amandine. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, a writer, uh, an Afro-feminist activist and also an activist on uh, the issue of adoption, uh, leading to my uh, signs that I don't really know exactly. I know I'm a Libra, but you know, like you need to have like your exact time of death, uh, of, uh, ooh, I was going to say death, so I'm talking to my therapist this afternoon, so this is going to be interesting. Uh, so um, of birth, <laughs> you need to have your exact time of birth to know your rising signs and stuff. And I know that there can be other calculations, apparently, like I've had this conversation quite a few times with my friends, but I haven't done it yet. And so, yeah, it has to do with being adopted. So that's another, you know, important part of my identity that um, I've been adopted and therefore a lot of, and in France, uh, in what's called uh, Born Under Secrecy. So um, I didn't have a lot of access to many of my personal information and family information growing up. And even if I found out some stuff um, as an adult, uh, it's still not the same, you know. And I think even just engaging with your rising sign and stuff, it's kind of like, well, I was told maybe about my birth date hour when I was in my 30s, and it's sort of like difficult to invest. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, last intro question um, What do you care about today? Oh, well, today I must uh, be honest, I, I, I care a lot about going. Not, not really on the holidays, but just like slowing down. Like I'm waiting for mid-December for everybody to leave and so that I will receive less emails and have less work to do. <laughs> That's what I mostly care about right now. Yeah, that is such a vibe. Um, and also we love Libras in this space. <laughs> I truly do. <laughs> um, yeah, do you want to go next? Yeah, okay. Who are you? Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so my name is Melisandre Varin. I prefer to be called Mel. Um, I am Sim's partner, lover, and uh, cheerleader since yesterday. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, a young um, school parent. Eol is almost four. Um, I'm an artist and I'm someone that doesn't want to work anymore until <laughs> 2023 but I w yeah I don't want to manifest things that are going to come against me but I just like yeah mm -hmm. uh, that's who I am uh, then my um, uh, placements I'm a Pisces sun and double Libra and I love Libras <laughs> we're the best <laughs> what do you care about what today? do i care about today today i care about um what do i care about today today i care about uh stopping stopping my brain from overthinking mm -hmm. of every of everything so after the our conversation i'm gonna pull some cards take a bath mm. read mm -hmm. so i care about like trying to find a way to uh, I, I need to uh, put it into words because there is no visual. 
to find a way to ground back. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I care about today. Nice. What about you, Sim? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> to this little duo uh, thing we have going on. Um, so my name is Sim. Uh, I am also Mel's partner. Part Mel is my partner. Um, and also a co-parent to almost four-year-old Ayol. Um, I am a movement artist, a facilitator, part-time community worker. Um, yesterday I started to say daydreamer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I like to get lost in worlds and portals, um, of mine and others. And, uh, I'm an Aries sun. I'm a Pisces moon and a Sagittarius rising. I am very um, all over the place emotionally, which is fine. I own that. Um, They are. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, and today I care about... Mm, today I care about not being wet in the rain. <laughs> I care about also resting and also slowing down my brain. Uh... Yeah, I think the same that I've been saying for the past week of like, I care about the micro moments of slowing down, just taking things step by step, also slowing down with work. Um, and yeah, not burning out before the end of the year. <laughs> mm. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the intros. Um, so yeah, we can get into the extracts. I feel like I'm going to let Mel go first. <laughs> um, all right they weren't prepared but uh it's okay so uh today i would like to share with you also i didn't say my intro like i'm a big fan of amandine so it's like uh, and i'm glad i'm, I'm <laughs> glad i'm feeling uh cold uh, like i have a cold i'm feeling and when otherwise i would be like <laughs> So it's like giving me like some constant, yeah, like keeping it cool. constant. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna share uh, um, writing by Koleka Kutuma uh, from a book called Kulo Bu by Coco Come In. I actually never like read it out loud. It's like it's yeah, like this. But hello, bye bye, Coco Come In. Yes. Yeah, so this um, extract is called um, this poem actually is called I saw the best minds of my generation. I saw the best minds of my generation who desecrated the pages of Paradise Lost, who reaped the side effects of Bantu education, who sticky taped colonial statues with their faces, who built the same oppressive altars to oppress each other, who used unwritten memoirs to lynch the curriculum and its founders, who sang struggle songs with the same posture as their great, great and grand grand, who chanted with the blue van Kwamzumu with their chest, with their mouths as barbed wire, as water cannon, as grenades, clashing with naked breasts up against armed police and a looted state run by a rapist president who, wa who was succeeded by one who murdered minors in Marikana, who asked why, more often than they asked what. I'm going to stop here. Shall I read it again? Because, uh, yeah, I like to read it twice. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to give myself permission. Uh, I saw the best minds of my generation, who desecrated the pages of Paradise Lost, who ripped the side effects of Bantu education, who sticky taped colonial statu statues with their faces, who built the same oppressive altars to oppress each other, who used unwritten memoirs to lynch the curriculum and its founders, who sang struggle songs with the same posture as their great great and grand grand, who chanted with the blue van Kwamsunu with their chest with their mouths as barbed wire, as water cannon, as grenades, clashing with naked breasts, up against armed police and a looted state run by a rapist president, who was succeeded by one who murdered minors in Marikana, who asked why more often than they asked what. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a... Uh, 
it's the beginning of a poem by Koleka Kutuma, that is uh, an exceptional uh, being, I suppose, and an exceptional writer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm. <laughs> no extra words. Ah, um... I mean, you don't have to. Um, what was the line about the, the altars? Can I... Yeah. Uh... So da, 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 da. we built the same oppressive altars to oppress each other. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, one of the sentences that stayed with me, and also I stopped at the passage where I stopped, who asked why more often than they ask what, mm. uh, because that uh, is the second one, but uh, mm. also like uh, was deeper to me. Mm. But I felt it deeper in me. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about um the the use of the word alter as something to oppress and to build to then uh oppress further it's really interesting yeah thank you for sharing my pleasure <laughs> um amandine uh would you be okay to share your extract next so initially i wanted to read from plantation memories from guada quilomba but then he started reading poetry, and I was like, "Oh, I would like to read from uh, from Martin Shires teaching uh, my mother how to give birth." So uh, that's what I'm gonna be. Uh, that's what I'm gonna be reading uh, a poem from that uh, from that book uh, that I really like uh, that I like a lot a lot. And I'm just gonna okay. So it's called Bone. Uh, this one poem. I find a girl the height of a small whale living in a spare room. She looks the way I did when I was 15, full of salt and pepper. She spends all day up in the room, measuring her size. Her body is one long sigh. You notice her in the hallway. Later that night, while we lay beside one another, listening to her throw up in our bathroom, you tell me you want to save her. Of course you do. This is what she does best. Makes you sick with the need to help. We have the same lips, she and I. The kind main thing about when they are with their wives. She is starving. You look straight at me when she tells us how her father likes to punch girls in the face. I can hear you in our spare room with her. What is she hungry for? What can you fill her up with? What can you do that you would not do for me? I count my ribs before I go to sleep. So the, the, the sentence that is uh, really staying with me every time is her body is one long sigh. I think it's so beautiful and also because there's the rhyme before uh, uh, you know like about sighing and and uh, yeah i love that book just like just the title like i picked the book just because of the title uh, and also like you know because um regarding adoption and and family building and i think it's really an interesting book because the idea that you can teach your parents things and you know that you can teach your parents to give birth was really powerful for me i think uh, in terms of like uh, broken genealogy, you know, uh, being adopted, being separated from my birth family, um, and then even in my family, you know, uh, having to do a lot of, I think, teaching and pedagogy, being a black kid in a white family. So having this sense that it's not necessarily adults knowing better or, you know, that, that teaching only goes one way from top to bottom or from like elders to youngest, but having this relationship being all mixed. Is um is something that really moved me, and um and I find that idea again in the film. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, Celine Dion's Petite Maman, so it's sort of like Little Mom, and it's an uh, intimate time travel film. So the concept of the film is that there's this little girl who is playing, and she ends up meeting her mother, and she she's in a wood. So it's a time travel sort of like fantasy. So this little girl plays in the wood and she meets another little girl and it turns out to be her mother when she was a little girl. And so it's this whole idea of what would happen if uh, your children would meet you as a child. And I love this so much. Like at the end of the screening, I was like, do you know what I'm trying to teaching my mother how to give birth? I was just like, I couldn't stop thinking about the book while watching the film. So yeah, but yeah. That's my extract. Wow. Yeah, honestly, I feel like that's sort of like mind blowing. I don't know why mm. this concept of like mm. if you were to meet your parent as a child and like what you could provide for each other. 
like I, I like this idea already of like the cyclical nature of um, pedagogy or like uh, learning and, and passing through and on things but the idea of like meeting mm. the child parent I don't know it boggles it boggles mm. my mind yeah, I guess it uh, requires lots of vulnerability also, like, to mm. just, like, I, I never thought about it because I, I think, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would hate for Eol, for example, my child to meet me as <laughs> because I feel, I would feel ashamed or not ready. Like, I don't feel like I'm vulnerable with myself. Uh, mm. so much that I could uh, uh, accept this idea, but mm. I'm going to muse on it. Um mm. And uh, being more gentle with my little mouth mm. inside of me, mm. I suppose. I think it's a, for me, it's an invitation to do that. Yeah. For me, I see it as like compassion for the self, but mm. also compassion for those, uh, like for me having a difficult relationship with my parents, seeing them younger in a hyper vulnerable state, mm. meeting them maybe before. Like before the built up of masks. Yeah, like the built up yeah. of masks and before like trauma sat in their bones and like uh changed their um neurological pathways you know like uh before all of that just seeing like and meeting with innocence um yeah it really allows me to like shift like a perspective when it comes to parental mm -hmm. figures um mm -hmm. it's so interesting because it's like such a simple idea but how come that we never had this idea <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah thank you for sharing that thank wow you. um and i too uh with my extract is also poetry so uh, i like it yeah okay. it's over there um i quite like that we're all uh doing poetry today <laughs> um yeah. so so uh my extract is from maroon choreography by fahima ife um and sort of this ongoing conversation about um fugitivity black fugitivity um but also the writing is like one continuous dance. It's like written as though it's a dance, um, I guess, because it's called choreography. Um, but also because it is, it is a dance. It is a dance, yeah. <laughs> it is quite literally a dance um, and there's different parts to it. So I am going to read from... Okay. So it reads, Earth swallowed and alienated as air or as nothing insofar as their dearly beloved movement is shadowed, withdrawn, and out of touch. Here they are, nameless body spirit, only not woman, not man, not sex, not gender, not child, not father, not adult, not mother, not daughter, not son, not nephew, not niece, not female, not male, not intersex, not scripted, not pronoun, not name, not label, not capital, not human, not captive. Not master, not mastered, not mistress, not misery, not form, abstraction. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, uh, it's funny because one, this book sort of, I don't know, it holds a lot of sentiment because it's, uh, it's a way that we both connected, the way that me and Mal connected. Um, and it's the book that I needed to read at that point, like a year ago, just over a year ago um it just sort of like opened worlds for me and uh now at the moment going through sort of like a different level of transition in my life it's nice to know that um one fugitivity is not capped it's not uh, a defining thing but also to be bodiless like just um mutating spirit form that is just sort of evolving through space and time and physicality mm. <laughs> if that makes sense um so yeah <laughs> love it mm -hmm. and the, yeah the end I, I am like for me i was thinking i am ab abstraction the, the mm. right to be uh, abstraction and nothing else mm. Mm. Uh, felt very comforting to me just now yeah and i also was thinking that uh, it's really interesting how it flows uh, between amandine's reading and yours mm. amandine's reading plus uh, the mention of the film and yours mm. because also like with this idea of meeting allowing uh, uh, little ones to meet us as uh, little ones as well mm. And uh, and I and of us as uh, uh, anyway you got it <laughs> that um, it's also before all those identities that we sort of like feel that we need to uphold to survive mm. before all those masks uh, were um, 
fixed um, greffé mm. on uh, on us. Mm. Um, it's like when you, the, not uh, not gender, not no, 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 mm -hmm. you know, like just like it's like the stripping and stripping. And yeah, stripping. yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah to, to me, it's like, you know, like I actually, I think what really touched me in both like the book and, and then the film that I mentioned and what echoes what you, what you just said, Mel, is that um, the thing of, I often, like when I meet people, I actually always try to imagine them as children. And I always like wonder if we had been friends when we were children, you know, like I was, a, I was a, like a really open child. Like uh, one of the things that like, my parents were campers, we were camping a lot when I was a kid. And so when they were like putting the tent up, I would go like to the children's square, you know, like there's always like a, a space in the, in the camping for children. And I would just like stay posted there and I would wait for the children to pass and I'd be like, Hey, my name is Amandine. Do you want to be my friend? Do you want to play? <laughs> and it was just like, you know, and sort of like this image, um, then a lot of things happen. And I sort of like, you know, exactly what you said, you know, the mask, you sort of like get tripped of this, you know, sort of like this inner nature you have, even though I still do have it, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to cultivate it because I think that it's not because like the world is an awful place a lot of the time that I should no longer be who I am at my core. Because I really feel that I'm still this child being like, hey, do you want to be my friend? Hi, you know? And so, um, and so, yeah, I'm always thinking about that. You know, I'm meeting someone, and I'm like, oh, you know, would have they stopped by when I was at the, at the playground? You know, would I, you know, what would have been their energy? And quite often, you know, that people I meet, and, you know, even my partner, it's like one of those things, We've had these conversations many times where, like, oh, we would have been such great friends as kids. It would have been so fun meeting as kids, you know, as little kids and just, like, play and, you know. And um, so, yeah, I, I really like this idea of, like, being bodiless or sort of, like, that time doesn't really exist, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah, just this constant level of, like, fluidity. But that's, like, that's so sweet. I have no idea. I yeah. feel like I was such a shy child but i think if mm. someone came up to me like but then it would have been good for us because i would mm. have been like someone at the playground with you too but would have just like stalked you I would, from afar <laughs> i was a creepy child <laughs> <laughs> and at some point towards the end of the camping holidays i would have been like hey can i play with you? <laughs> like a tap on the shoulder like <laughs> and maybe you would have sat with me because you would have been shy as well maybe maybe yeah, <laughs> yeah but i love that i love this like going back to you and thinking about ourselves in this, uh, yeah, non form, uh, before these masks, before the stripping. And like, uh, even for me, I think this like transition that I'm taking in my life, it's like, I have to go through medical whatever's to get to where I want to go. But ultimately I have to remind myself, it's not about the rigidity of what earth is saying it is. It's like, it's, I'm transitioning into a bodiless thing and transitioning back into what I've always been, you know? Mm. But what? Well, well, I don't want to like, <laughs> there's nothing to contradict, but I mm. think for me, I see it as a, a um, return to your mm. many forms yeah. rather than like uh, being formless or mm. bodiless. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's like multiple but it's also nothing. It's that, mm, that mm. contradiction of the self. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about me. <laughs> now, since we are with you, <laughs> we would like to ask you, the, to, we would like to get to know more of you uh, in the way of the three questions. So the first question is, um, is actually a question from a children, inspired by a children book uh, I was reading with Eol. So it's, who was waiting for you to be born? Yeah, when I read the questions, I was like, oh, well, that's a, that's a, an interesting one for me <laughs> and a weird one. Um, so, yeah, I don't, um, it's really strange. Like for a long time, I considered that I was sort of like born alone. And um, and I think it has to do with like Western concepts of, uh, you know, family and, uh, and uh, what it means to be born with people. I was relinquished as, um, as a newborn by my birth mother. Um, and so for a long time, I considered that I was, you know, born alone. Um, but then, you know, like growing up and thinking a lot about family bathing and what it meant to be separated at birth, et cetera, with, uh, with my birth family, I realized that there was something like this myth, right? That if you're not expected by your birth parents, it's like no one was waiting for you or expecting you. 
And even that is not entirely true because for me to be born under X, which is sort of like the the colloquial name for being born under secrecy in France, so there's you know um, different types of adoption. Uh, but when you're born under secrecy, all your um, legal ties with your birth family are cut, and it's sort of like as if you were I, I call that you know like the sort of like a clean slate children, you know. Uh, the narrative around this is that you're born, like you're coming from nothing, <laughs> you know, there was nothing, and then there's your adopted family. And I think that's also why I felt that I was like born alone and that no one was expecting me. But if you really look at the process, uh, birth mothers, they have to meet social workers, then they have, you know, like to discuss their case and to be sure that they really want to relinquish the child, et cetera. So even from their perspective, there is a plan in this. You know, like they are not just, you know, uh, pregnant and then leaving you on those steps of a church. But even that, you know, for a long time, I was like, oh, because it's better to than to be left on the on the on the, you know, on the steps of a church. But even then, there's a plan. Even when you're left on, you know, on top of like the trash on the day of the pickup of the trash, because you're not in the trash. You're where you can be found. You know, if you're put on the steps of the of the church on church, uh, you know, on Sunday, it's so that you can be found. So even in that case, there is a plan, you know, there is a plan for you. And maybe you're not expected as in expected by your specific family that happens to be your birth family. But you were expected like, and I was also expected in the mind of my, in the mind of my parents, my adoptive parents, you know, they were um, expecting a child, they were waiting, they had been part of like the adoption process for, you know, months, if not years. Um, they already had my brother, but they had, so that my brother sort of like came in their life by accident. He was, uh, he was in a group home and my mom was his teacher. And because nobody visited him, they, they first started to, um, you know, sponsor him and having for the weekends and the holidays. And in France, if you're not visited by your birth family for more than a year, you can be adopted. And my brother was quite old at that, at that stage, he was six, seven. So my parents asked him if he wanted to live with them, you know, for good and be adopted. And he said, yes. So that's how they ended up being uh, parents to a black child. You know, it was uh, sort of like a, an encounter, a life encounter. But because it was the 80s and not everybody uh, was keen on adopting black children, back then in France, it was really not a trend. <laughs> you know, Matt and I, and everyone hadn't come for this. So social workers told my parents that if they were, you know, happy to have another uh, child of color and potentially black, uh, it would be faster. And they were like, you know, uh, we it's okay for us. Like, we're happy to have another black child. So, you know, I was sort of like, you know, forming in my parents' heads or, you know, desires. And um, and when you are about to be born, the case workers, uh, they warn your adoptive parents because basically it's quite different <laughs> from other births. It's like, so there's a child that's about to be born in a week. Are you ready? Because if you're ready in three months, she's in your home. And so you have to be like, oh, okay, <laughs> and then prepare everything. So um, And also people are taking care of you. You know, there were nurses. Um, I was, um, I was, uh, you are placed. So the law states that your birth mother can change your mind for the first three months. So you don't go to the adoptive uh, family straight away. You go to um, um, a place for children who've been separated from their birth mothers. And you're waiting there. But even that, like for me, was always this uh, weird space because I was like, what happened? You know, I've always had this thing of like, there is this big, um, question mark on the first five months of my life because actually I got to my parents' house at five months and there's only two pictures of me um, you know in that time so there's really like this big mystery like how many nurses were they the same nurses you know day and night and also I was sharing a room with another relinquished child and so it's been one of the my life obsessions who is that person where are they we are you know for me like they're my siblings you know, I really wish I could know who this person is because it's the only person, well, like one of the right persons who's had the exact same experience of just, you know, a really weird first few months. Not everybody's loved, you know, like there can be postpartum depression or whatever, but most of the time you do end up in a family or in your family for the first few months. It's very special, uh, you know, uh, except, you know, if you're sick, for instance, that you spend the first few months of your life in a hospital-like uh, setting with people who are professional taking care of you. So, you know, I've, I've moved through my life from nobody was expecting me and there's like this big void of my first few months to, well, actually it's more complex uh, than that, but it's still, you know, it's still a weird um, time 
phase of my life. And so that's why my answer is so long because I, I, you know, I'm still sort of like negotiating it, you know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just like musing on everything you said. Um, yeah, but maybe we can, uh, go into the, the second question. Mm -hmm. Would you like to offer? Okay. Uh, who is holding you tight for you to grow? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's another one. Um, I would say, well, you know, uh, in my adult years, definitely, well, in the past 10 years, uh, definitely my partner, you know, we've, we've been together 10 years, almost uh, going on 11. And I'd never been in a relationship before. Um, like, you know, you know I, I really didn't believe in couples. <laughs> you know, I, was, I felt like I, it just seemed so weird to me, you know. It's just like, why would you? I want to spend all your time with one person and, you know, um, and then well, I did find, you know, my person. I'd be happy also to have other people, you know, I, I, uh, we, we're not in an exclusive relationship, but it's true that when you're building something with someone, it takes a lot of time. You know, it takes a lot of time and energy and space. And I'm like, you know, I, I think the concept of polyamory is beautiful, but I'm like, who has the time? <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. I was like, who you? Like, if I were to pursue multiple relationships with like that level of commitment, and I'm just like, whoa, that that's intense. But I think we can sort of like move also between relationship and, and things don't necessarily have to be so intense um, and sort of like time consuming. As if you find a person with whom you're spending a lot of your time, but we work together on top of it. So you know, like there's this thing, and I I really think I've grown because there is something. Um, in that love that gives you confidence and that, you know, like I was really a sort of like, uh, you know, uh, no future kind of person for a long time. I was convinced I would be dead by the time, you know, I was like 27, 33. <laughs> but I, I never had some type of like projection for the future. I was just, um, um, yeah. Um, and at the same time, I was like a, a, a romantic at heart, like I've always loved rom-coms, no matter how bad and heteronormative, you know, they are, but I like the idea of like, it ends up well, and, and love is stronger than anything, you know, like, well, that's, again, you know, like you can see some of like my child being like, hey, hey ha, ha. <laughs> I can't help myself, you know, like, I've had to also accept that, because sometimes I was like, you know, uh, sometimes I even feel like I would like to be more melancholic, because it's sort of, it appears to be deeper, right? You know, like happy people always, always, almost seem shallow, you know? And sometimes I'm, like I can, well, I've recently been actually pretty depressed, so I, I know that I can go there. <laughs> but I was like, you know, sometimes I would even get angry at myself for being like, oh, I'm a bit sad. And then I see, I don't know, a bird or a kid, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> hello. And then I'm like, oh, my God, like can't I can't even stay in my melancholy for like five minutes, you know? So, but, you know, that, that's who I am. And so having found this thing that I was hoping I would find one day, you know, like a great love story, um, uh, having someone also like, I feel, and, that, and I think that's something also that has to do with racism, right? I've always wondered what it was like to grow up with people looking at you, sort of, um, you know, one of the things I hate the most, I think, in anti-blackness is that because we are dehumanized, quite Rarely, especially as children, do we have, especially if we, you know, live in majority white spaces, which was my case, schools, etc. Extremely rarely do we have adults who are seeing themselves in us. And, you know, this idea of mentorship, this idea of, like, recognizing someone who's like you, and then this love and this uh, hope that the adult has for you is building you and is making you stronger and is helping you project yourself, like... I had access to that by chance when I was eight because, like, the father of one of my good friends in my village, he was African-American and a professional basketball player. And I started, you know, like, squatting this family, being like, hi, I will be sleeping at your house once a week because, you know, I really want to be around you people. And, um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, this person has been really important in my drinking. You know, Pierre was really, like, the first black person who saw me and who was like, you know, and because he was a professional athlete, but he had also been really good at school, like all through my adolescence, it's someone who really pushed me. And I, and I felt the impact of having someone like that was like, I know you can do it. You're brilliant. You can do this. Like, you know, 
And but I really didn't have this much growing up, you know. And I feel that in a loving, supportive relationship, you get that on a on a daily basis, you know, those affirmations. And uh, and I remember at the, at the very beginning when we got together with with Enrico, I was a struggling actress. I had no money. And nothing was going my way professionally, and I was lost. I was 28. I felt like a failure. All my friends were, you know, because I had gone to grade school. A lot of my friends now had already had like good jobs, good paying jobs and stuff. And I was really stuck. And uh, and so, you know, one day I was I was depressed. And I was like, well, clearly I'm not going to make it. I'm never going to be an artist or, uh, you know. And Enrico like looked at me and he was like, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to do it. And he seemed so convinced that it got me convinced. You know what I mean? Like, I know that day has been like so important in my life because I was like, oh, well, if you, know, if you think I'm going to make it, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to. I'm going to find my way. <laughs> it's it's going to happen. And so, yeah, this thing has been really ha- uh, important. Uh, my mom has been like that as well. When I was a kid, like, she was really sort of um, always telling me how smart I was, that I could do anything. Uh, and uh, how smart I was has been really important in my life. I think, again, black children are so looked down upon. Again, anti-blackness is really based on how we are closer to animals and not in a good, you know, anti cystist way, <laughs> in a, like, we don't have a brain way, you know? Um, and so I think that when I was a kid, it wasn't, it didn't appear to be that important. But growing up, I realized that my mom always insisting on my intellectual, you know, abilities and the fact that I could do anything that I was, you know, so quick on my feet and stuff that she got me to believe that. And I, I really believe that, you know, um, there is a, a thing to be done, especially with black children, like in our communities, about doing this job of making sure that they see in our eyes that we mean it and that we believe that they can do it. Because when you get this energy, if it's really authentic, it gives you wings. At least it's given me wings. So I, I feel that when I get that, but it, now it can sort of like be stranger. It's true that on a daily basis, it's really good. To have a partner that's affirming you, you know, but you get it in the public's reaction to your work, um, and you can get it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna finish with that. But for instance, um, and so that's my thing. I, I can like, I like to see signs from the universe, uh, and you know, like that. So um, two years ago, on December 31st, we got this uh, call from our accountant saying, oh, um, I didn't know that you closed the production film company, um, you know, uh, so we're going to have to do something about that. And and Rico and I were like, we didn't close the company. And we find out that this administrative thing had shut down our company without notifying us, and that we had to go on December 31st before they closed their offices at like 4 and it was 10, you know, to try and get an explanation and try to get our company back. And this, it had already been a grueling year. And I was like, you know, I had gotten up thinking like, oh, that's it. at least it's over. And it was like, you know, uh, the final, you know, uh, push in the horror movie when the monster comes out of the closet and you think that they were dead, but they're like, yeah, you know, and I was just like, that's it. I, I'm done. So we got on the, on the tram. And we went to the administrative body to see what we could do about the company. And I was so down and I was so upset. And I just, I, I was sitting like that, just like looking at the window. I was like, I couldn't even look at Enrico. I was so depressed. And there was this little girl and she was, I don't know, like uh, three, four. And she didn't speak French really well, you know, because I lived in saint Denis, So there's like the whole world is there. And she had a smaller sibling, like the three-year-old. And she was like playing near me and she really wanted to connect, you know, she wanted to connect and to talk and, and you couldn't really understand what she was saying and stuff. And then at some point I was like, do I want to be the adult asshole with touching her that because I'm having a bad day, you know, uh, then she should not be enjoying herself in the, the tram and I'm not going to talk to her. So like, it really took a lot out of me, but I was just like, I'm going to interact with her. And so she was talking to me in French, Arabic, you know, I couldn't understand anything, but she was so happy. But clearly it was December 31st, so she knew she was going to a party. So she was pointing her brother to me and she was like, that's my brother, that's my brother. <laughs> but I don't know. And she pulled me out of my funk, you know. By the, by the time we got to this administrative body, I was just like, you know what? You know, like, it's just like an administrative problem. You know, that's life. You know, like, I felt that she was like, you know, taking my hand. I was like, you know, 
am I going to take this hand and get out of my funk or I'm going to stay in this thing when I get this opportunity presented to be back into life, right? And, um, and then when we got to the administrative body, because I was no longer in my funk, we managed to get through to the guy who was initially super aggressive and stuff. But I don't know, my, my energy had changed. And so we managed to change the energy of this guy and then that problem was solved. And then we got home and we could like finally have, you know, our end of year celebration. So yeah, it can be the people really close to you. And it can also be, you know, that little girl on the tram, you know, it's just like, it's also about spotting those moments and, 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 you know, taking them. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so I think so many things came out of that. Like, um, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing. That's such a, <laughs> such a sweet story. And also like those nice reminders of like, when you're in that funk and then you're, you're getting deeper and deep, deeper, mm-hmm. like sinking, it's like, uh, coming back to this whole aspect of inner child going back to the child it's like get your shit together <laughs> like come on get up like we're gonna do this thing i love that and uh, you were talking about uh, this uh, person that like gave you cheered you up back it's also a reminder that as you were saying that uh, in sometimes uh those bodies uh and like uh, those administrative steps and so, so they feel so heavy mm. um because we give them more importance. I mean, like, it was really important. Your company was going to be uh, shut down, right? But uh, I think, like, just a reminder that, like, we oscillating all of the time between fiction and realities. Mm. And that our energies are actually uh, the most pa- powerful tool that we, that we own. Mm. And uh, the energies that emanate, emanate from our bodies and from ourselves mm. are not necessarily only ours as well. So how do we recognize that more and more in our everyday mm. and how do we so- source energy from it and also like um uh share energy with others i don't have much words today but mm. um ha- like how do how this uh, energy sharing mm. becomes uh the um, blueprint of mm-hmm. our everyday of our quotidian more than what we think we see mm. if it makes sense because for me yeah, I, I get caught in other people's reality a lot. Mm. Um, and like reminding ourselves that uh, everything is about energy exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I really love uh, the, I am like here for love stories, romance stories. Yes. I can like, I could, if I could, I would spend my life <laughs> hearing about uh, romantic stories. Yeah, and but, literally, um, yeah. yeah, I feel like that whole thing of... Um, feeling like melancholy is the thing that's like deep and that's the thing that is more like thoughtful and you know but sometimes like we just have to allow ourselves to feel like joy and happiness and like you were saying about feeling like you need to know and project yourself into the future because I don't know if I've ever really like uh, thought about it in that way and how we then pass on to future generations that are coming like knowing that like giving them hope and allowing themselves to see themselves in the future. It feels like such a small thing that seems obvious, but like, like you said, like it it took a really long time to like be able to project and see yourself existing in Mm. the literal future. Mm. Yeah. While you were saying that, I was actually like thinking because 27 and 33 years old is also this year, um, uh, this lifetime where uh, the Saturn return. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't going to say that, but uh, actually, yeah. But also, like, lots of uh, big uh, star uh, died when they were 33 or 27 years old. Mm. Um, So I was, yeah, I I, I don't know, like, for me, it was interesting in terms of number. And now I was also reflecting on the fact that I always thought that uh, of myself as a 30 years old person. Mm. But uh, now that I reach that point, it's like, Mm. I base no plan for <laughs> for, for after this time. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um as a final question, last question. Uh how to create loving environments in the arts too. I also thought, you know, when I read it, I thought, wow, that's interesting because I don't know. I mean, what I would say is that um if you think of art as, you know, like an industry, like for me now, it's an industry, right? Uh, so I had my production company in France. Now we moved to Canada. We've just started another production company here. Um, I think, you know, it's sort of like I'm, I'm really torn in the conversations around, you know, safe spaces and, and creating loving spaces, loving environment, or, um, you know, how can you get loving kindness to emerge in violent environments? 
you know, like I, you know, my sort of like automatic answer was like, you cannot expect academia, the art industries, or whatever space that is, you know, um, um, inhabited by capitalism, uh, histories of violences, <laughs> patriarchy, etc. Like, there's no amount of love that we're going to bring into them and that's going to turn these places into safe spaces. I'm the dragon, call me Dracula as I sink these fangs in your jugular, ay. Yeah, you last said about uh, you don't really believe uh, that just loving within these environments can change it when it's uh, inherently violent. But then the last thing we heard was uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, yeah, what, what, what worries me is when, when people are sort of like trying to promise that they can create safe spaces. Like I would never sort of like take this responsibility. You know, um, I, I would always, I, I'd rather what we do, like in the film industry or whatever, which are guidelines, like, you know, things that will not be tolerated on set, or that you are, uh, that if you are part of this organization, then you agree that sexual harassment, rah, rah, you know, is not acceptable. And then because we have these guidelines in places, when people get out of line, you can be like, well, look, you know, you agreed to those rules. And you have now, you know, um, uh, not respected those rules. So we are within our rights to terminate your contract or, you know, to decide that this is not okay and, and to deal with it, you know. Um, so that's more the way I approach it because I think that sometimes um, if you are expecting violent places to be able to sort of like accommodate you or accept you, like like you are in for a rude awakening, you know, because that's not how it's going to happen. You know, I, I never really had sort of like a, an entrepreneur side uh, originally, but I realized that if I wanted to make the films I want to make, I have to become an entrepreneur. And initially we thought that we would only have a production company to produce our film. And then again, because I'm getting older and, you know, like visible, I, I've been getting more visible in the past few years. Now I'm getting a lot of youth, like, you know, I'm 38, so getting close to 40 now. <laughs> so I'm getting people who are, you know, 20 years younger than me who are writing to me and they want to come do internships at my company. And I'm like, we're working from our living room. You know, this is not, a, <laughs> this is not really a company or not in that sense. And for a long time, I had a, an issue with um, leading. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that Princess Permit was this idea of, um, I don't like hierarchy. I've always hated having people who were supposed to be my superior or whatever. So I could not really see myself leading anything because I was like, it can only be a hierarchical rapport that I don't want to engage in. But in a way, doing that, you're also sort of like not fulfilling uh, what could be your path or even should be your path, you know? Uh, so for me, getting more and more younger, black, you know, people, artists, sending me their scripts, asking me if they come into at my, at my company. I also realized that I was sort of like escaping my responsibility. You know, I don't know how it's going to work out and which form it's going to take because it's still going to be my company. But now I want to be a real producer in the sense that I would like to be able to do what Avadio Verne is doing, for instance, in the Anglophone world. I would like to be able to do that in the Francophone world. And to do that, you have to actually build a company with people working with you or for you. You have to... Um, to get more power, money, knowledge, um, to like, I was like, I cannot mentor people when I don't even really know what I'm doing, you know, and when I'm working from my living room, like that's not how it works. So like, for instance, for me, the next couple of years are going to be about um, forming myself, like getting information on management and, uh, and actually how do you uh, rule, uh, like how do you organize a production company so that I can produce other people's films. Because that's the thing as well where I was just like, but yeah, I felt at some point I just felt like I was escaping my responsibility because I was like, everybody, all these young people are turning up to me and I'm like, that, sorry, can't help you, which is also a cop out, right? You know, it's like to me at some point it sort of really felt like, Ah, uh, you know, well, uh, I can't produce a film, so I can't have you as an intern. And it's tough, you know. I try sometimes to do it, and it takes time. You know, mentorship, it's like you're going to get people who are really motivated, but they're young, they don't know how to work. They're just like, <laughs> and so, like, there's this whole thing, and you also have to deal with their projections on you. You know, like, for me, it was like, I don't want to be their mom. 
I don't want to be, you know, whatever. But that's the thing. If you become an elder in whatever community you're part of, and I'm a black, adoptive, pansexual, you know, like I know that there are many of me out there for a black youth to be like, oh, when I'm a grown up, I want to be that too. You know, like what Ava Duvan has done for me, well, why shouldn't I do, or why, you know, should I escape doing it for other people, you know? And so um, that's the thing for me. But then I don't exactly know, like I'm going, I was like, so if people are coming to work for me, I'm going to, you know, obligate them to uh, join a union so that we have a better, you know, <laughs> balance of power. You know, like I'm sort of, I'm sort of like thinking of what it could look like now. Um, and then I'm like, you know, maybe after a few years, it should become maybe a co-op or at least a thing where, you know, the people working there want to, you know, like I used to work in hospitality a lot. And uh, one of the places, like that used to be the tradition in Paul. Uh, when you work working in a restaurant, the longer you stayed, the more uh, parts of dividends from the, the, the restaurant uh, earnings you would get. You know, and I thought that could be something that you use in your company. The longer people stay, uh, the more they get, you know, the parts of the earnings. So this way, you're not just like an employee, but you're really sort of like owning, uh, you know, rights and, and prospering as well. So um, we have to start, like, to me, that's more where it's at now, you know, um, um, addressing the fact that, yes, uh, I'm going to have a, a company in a capitalist society and I'm going to be the owner. But can I do that in a way that other people will then have their company or will then be able to mentor, you know, uh, black youth who want to make films, et cetera. Like that's, that's more my approach uh, than sort of like guaranteeing that we're going to have a safe space. Like this is work, you know, we're going to be producing films. There's got to be stress. You know, I don't yell, but like the, the, by deep moments where it's going to be tough. So I don't want to have told you like, oh, come work for me because I'm a black woman and everything will be fine, you know. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my answer. Gosh, I love it. And so thank you so much. You're so honest. Yeah. <laughs> but I, honestly, like, I love that. I think that's such a valuable response because I feel like the way that you look at it is not this airy fairy, you know, mm. like, we're just going to love each other. We're going to mm. love each other through the hardships. We're going to hold each mm. other. But it's like, no, but I'm also going to implement these things that keep you safe whilst you're working mm -hmm. with me. And I suppose in some elements for me. Um, so there is a lot of reliance on the making sure that we put together or we put in place uh, mm -hmm. accountability tools. Accountability tools. Yeah. So you can hold me accountable. I can hold you accountable. Yeah. And uh, in the end, like this is like our aim is to like make those films and so on. Exactly. But it's not, uh, I, yeah, I can't, I can't be everything for you exactly. and you can't be everything for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. It's like very like pragmatic mm -hmm. in a way. But uh, sometimes we need, you know, like a pragmatic foundation. So then yeah. after, yeah, we can love each other and so on. But at the end of the day, like... The work has to be done, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the work's got to get done. That's what we're here for. And, and we want to create something together. And so, to, yeah, I also wanted to say that sometimes we just have to work with the tools that we have while we start to create other, other ones yeah. and start to work in futurities while still, mm -hmm. still being anchored in, uh, you know, yeah, like where, yeah. where, where in which... Uh, the system we're operating in. Yeah. We can just go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a dog in a shell, this possessed obsession. I breathe from the vein of the server. Compulsive attention, so me in action. Every pixel I consume, growing carbon in the sky. Everybody ready for the night. Scarcity is the product, ego birth is the profit.